Pol Pot of Africa. In all those years, President Mengistu has rarely been interviewed, and when he has, he has seemed the classic third world dictator. But in the last few months, Mengistu has discovered Glasnost. Last weekend, he invited a crew from Eyewitness to Addis Ababa for an exclusive interview. We wanted to know, is there now any hope for Ethiopia? We are struggling for peace, for development, for equality, for all mankind. We are asking genuine peace-loving nations, individuals, parties, government to join us with this struggle. Mengistu Haile Mariam, for 13 years supreme leader of 50 million Ethiopians, Marxist army chief of staff and until now one of the world's more camera shy presidents. He first achieved notoriety in 1974 when, as a major in the army, he played a leading role in the coup that overthrew the 800-year-old dynasty of Emperor Haile Selassie. Three years later, Mengistu took control of the army and the instruments of government. Observers say many of his political opponents were jailed or murdered, as he embraced a form of Marxism that made him friends and brought him much-needed foreign aid, principally from the Soviet Union. With a new ideology in place and the army in control, Mengistu courted support from other revolutionaries. He found allies in the likes of Fidel Castro and played host to Libya's Colonel Gaddafi. But he needed more than just revolutionary solidarity. With the mounting foreign debt, Mengistu turned to the Soviets for help. In 1978, he signed a treaty of friendship with Leonid Brezhnev, which guaranteed Ethiopia financial and military aid. But with President Gorbachev, everything has changed. He has said he will cut military aid by the end of this year. Mengistu has declared his support for capitalism and democracy. Socialism is being killed off. But a change in political direction has done nothing to bring about peace in the 30-year-old civil war. Money which could be spent on feeding the four million Ethiopians on the brink of starvation is going to the war. The second poorest country in the world spends 65% of its budget on its army. Even greater sacrifices are now being called for. The war is at a turning point and the country's main backer is about to pull out. Since the beginning of this year, the Eritrean separatists in the north have been scoring major victories over Mengistu. But has the high casualty rate and the crippling cost had any effect on him? How long are you willing to send young Ethiopians, the future of this country, to the war in the north to be killed or maimed? In the first place, it is that I wish to send even a single individual to the north. And we don't want the war either. We did not start it. We have inherited the very noble value from our forefathers, and that is the national identity of the country. So if there is a challenge against this supreme value, we have no alternative but to defend ourselves. The province of Eritrea stretches along the entire Red Sea coast, and without it, Ethiopia would be landlocked. The key port of Massawa was taken by the rebels in February, a major loss that also marked the end of a nine-month ceasefire. In the fighting that followed, thousands died. The Ethiopian army says 3,000 were killed. The rebels claim 10 times that number. Mengistu says he's not prepared to make any concessions on Ethiopian unity, whatever the price. There is no authority in Ethiopia, no leadership most certainly, which has the mandate to allow the emergence of an independent state carved off from Ethiopia. Whatever they sacrifice, we are ready to pay. Even if it means another 30 years of war? Even if it continues for 100 years. 
are we to sign away the fate of our country? Is this generation, which is fully committed to the establishment of a just, democratic, and united Ethiopia, to sit over the disintegration of a country whose existence has been defended for millennia against all kinds of regional expansionists and European colonialists? Supposing these rebels manage to capture the city of Asmara and declare independence, well, that does not mean that the war has come to an end. Never. It will never come to an end. If they have this illusion, they are fighting for the unending and interminable extermination of the people. I travel to Asmara, the Eritrean capital, a garrison town still in government control, but surrounded by enemy troops. 120,000 government troops, almost the entire Second Army, are stationed here. The field hospital at Asmara bears testimony to the human cost of a war which Mengistu has never allowed television cameras to film. The hospital has 2,000 beds. Most of these troops have gunshot wounds. More serious cases go to another hospital five miles away. I was shown around by the army's senior surgeon, Brigadier General Gaga Oljo. He's been on the front line for the past seven years. He heads a team of eight doctors and 30 nurses, dealing with 200 casualties a day. <laughs> This man is typical of the patients here. He was wounded 17 days ago during an offensive to retake Masawa. Like all the men here, he will be sent straight back to the front line when he's recovered. In his case, it will be within three weeks. President Mengistu's second revolutionary army is one of the largest in Africa. It's led by Major General Wubshit Desi. From the day the fighting started, we lost 3,000 dead. You plan to retake Masawa? Oh yes, it's our mission because there is no choice. Without Masawa, it's very difficult even to uh, sustain the unity of the country. The loss of Masawa cut off the vital supply line which brought food aid to the starving in Eritrea and Tigray. Now it's having to be brought in through the much smaller port of Asab. The distances are greater and the journey time has trebled. Tons of food piles up on the docks because there aren't enough lorries to move it. The food corridor through Asab was opened just two months ago and the port is working around the clock to keep supplies flowing. Thanks to good luck more than anything else, it seems that a major famine has been averted this year. Although the rains fell late and the crops failed, food from the west is getting through to famine hit areas. I travel to Desi in the heart of Ethiopia to watch the food being distributed through both rebel and government held territory. It takes more than five days for the food to get to Desi by road. Once the food reaches Desi, it's loaded onto trucks run by the Joint Relief Partnership. The partnership is an Ethiopian church group which has been assured safe passage through the war zone. The men sing be strong, work hard as they load this grain from Britain, part of 200 tons a day donated to Ethiopia by the West. It 
It will be another six days before this truck arrives at its final destination. Abandoned by the Soviets, Mengistu seeks new friends. Top of his list, the Israelis. Both have a common enemy. They believe Arab states are backing the Eritrean rebels. At issue is control of the strategically vital Red Sea. Our relation with Israel is not with the hope that Israel will replace the Soviet Union as an ally of Ethiopia. I do not expect that a treaty of friendship and cooperation between us and the Soviet Union would come to an end. And I do not believe that the government of the Soviet Union will do this. Is Israel helping in the development of your arms industry? Our relation with Israel is not a military relationship. And let's not forget, this technology is not exclusive to the Soviet Union and Israel. I mean, you can buy the technology from anywhere as long as you have the money. So where are you buying them from? From the east or the west. We buy the technology from whoever is ready to sell it, because it is for defense purposes. These men from the 44 and 46 Brigade are Mengistu's crack troops. The final showdown in the war, which has claimed half a million lives, may be just days away. The rebels are boasting they will soon control Asmara. The government forces must retake Masawa to take the upper hand. And as the fighting escalates, new supplies will be vital. Most of the equipment that we've seen here today is made in the Soviet Union. They have uh, said that this year they will end their agreement to send military and financial aid to Ethiopia. How is that going to affect you? Well, for the present we have uh, equipment enough to fight. For the future, well, probably this is not my status to answer. <laughs> But it will be a, a severe blow when that line... If it continues, yeah. It's very, very difficult. Back in Addis Ababa, Mengistu is fighting a war on another front to convince the West that his newfound love for capitalism is genuine. Africa's biggest street market is a test bed for capitalism Mengistu style. Three months ago, the prices of produce from the deeply unpopular collective farms were fixed by the government. Today, government price controls have gone. President Mengistu has promised there will also be major political reforms. Will you allow parties with opposing views to yours to operate freely within the country? Party. Uh, we are party, the Ethiopian People's Democratic Unity Party, and as such we cannot decide, have no mandate on the making of other parties in our country. If it is in the interest of the unity of the people, there is no reason why other parties should not come to existence in this country. We decide on our future order as a party, and it is not our intention to retain the monopoly of power to be the only party. But it is the people, through the national parliament, Shengo, who will decide whether or not there will be other parties in Ethiopia. But as far as we are concerned, we will be willing to work with other parties here. So perhaps within two years we could see a multi-party democracy with candidates with opposing views to yours standing for election? Yes. It is quite possible, so long as the national Shengo decides yes. Twelve months ago, opposition to Mengistu was in the form of a military coup. Eleven generals tried to unseat him. Now they're standing trial for their lives. These are the first pictures of their court-martial. Their open and fair trial helps make Mengistu's case to the world that the rule of law, and not the gun, now reigns in Ethiopia. It's alleged that you killed 12,000 people to gain power and retain power. 
Is that true? Madam Maranagar. Of course, this is absurd. I mean, in the first place, it is not in my nature to kill even an insect or a small living thing, let alone human beings. If anyone perished during the planting of the revolution, it was certainly not on my orders. I did not single out any individual to be killed. This outrages my sense of humanity. How is it imaginable that I ordered the annihilation of 12,000 people? You have very kindly offered to show us the conditions in which political prisoners are kept. Would you extend that invitation to representatives of Amnesty International? We have invited them in the past. They have come and visited our prison system. And I renew this invitation any time. We have nothing to hide. The country's most famous political prisoners now live modestly on the outskirts of Addis Ababa. These 11 members of Haile Selassie's royal dynasty have served a total of 152 years in Mengistu's jails. They've been released over the past 24 months, but are still not allowed to travel abroad. Could each of you just tell me how long you've been in prison? 15 years. 14 years. 14 years. 14 years. 14 years. 15 years. For 14 years. 14 years. For nine years. For 15 years. 14 years. 78 year old Princess Tanana Ward is Haile Selassie's daughter. Uh, we were taken from our house and taken to another house in the name of Ethiopian Tutkam. We were put under house arrest. You spent 14 years in prison. Were you ever brought before a court? No. No, during, uh, oh. no, during that time, we were never brought before a court. Where did you spend those 14 years? At the beginning, we were under house arrest, and then we were taken to the central prison. 33-year-old Prince Bedi Makone has been in jail since he was 18. Were you treated well? Well, you know, yeah. Were you with uh, any other prisoners apart from your family? Yeah, there were prisoners in Alambakai. Mm. And were you able to associate with them? Yeah, but they were sympathetic. Mm. Were they treated well, do you know? Well. Were you ever fearful for your life? Well, initially, yes. You thought you were going to die? Yeah. I cannot deny that. That was unfortunate. During the revolution, without knowledge, has happened many things which uh, are not really uh, can make us happy. This is not peculiar for all Ethiopia. This happened through centuries in many countries. I can mention many, but it's one-time phenomena. I invite everyone to come and see the true nature of this country and what's going on around. That can be the only instrument to know about us or to trust us. The problem is not the leadership or our brutality. The problem is lack of peace. The all-important test for Mengistu should be his willingness to open negotiations to end the civil war. Without such a move, Mengistu's appeal to the West for help is likely to fall on deaf ears.